Um, I want to turn to my panel now and ask you, um, starting with the observation that I have, which is the invasion of Ukraine by uh, Russia precipitated quite unexpectedly a cascade of commentary in the U.S. about how Ukraine and Taiwan have a lot in common, and China will take the lesson from what Putin did. This was mostly in the early months of 2022 after the invasion. Um, there seemed to be a direct relationship between prediction of a coming invasion of Taiwan by China to the lack of knowledge of the person writing the commentary. We have a lot of non-experts offering so-called expert opinion on this. Um, you're all experts on your own countries and attitudes. What do you think are the prospects for this kind of conflict over Taiwan? Jisa has just reminded us that there, the U.S. is going through change with the return of the Republicans in Congress. Uh, we have an election yeah. coming up. Taiwan has a presidential election coming in January 2024, which invites all sorts of new political games to go on in Taiwan. China has just sort of stabilized after the 20th Party Congress. So the action is more likely to be outside China than in, in terms of changing the relationship among the three parties. Um, from your individual perspectives, how do you see the situation with respect to Taiwan? Well, don't you think that there are, there are experts and experts, and not all policies are made by the right experts? Yeah. Um, I mean, I don't think, if you've gone back, um, way back beyond before February the 24th, few people would have thought of the invasion, even of the Russian invasion of Ukraine, even though uh, there had been a battle, the, the war in Georgia in 2008, it lasted all of five days. I mean, we've got used to the idea that states do not get war against other states. They, they fight against non-state actors. So that's one thing. Uh, secondly, I think that um, Donald Trump, now I wouldn't call Donald Trump an expert on anything, yeah. But he really did change the whole, perhaps advised by people like Peter Navarro, um, picture vis-a-vis -vis China and the, and the USA. And the, the measures that Trump brought in, basically a trade war, um, they're there. And Biden hasn't taken away most of them. And now you have the chip choke. So I think, with all due respect to Samir, I mean, yes, everybody wants to avoid things going wrong, but they can go wrong. And one of the problems of, I mean, you know, Biden likes to think of this as democracies against authoritarian states, which I think is a very simplistic way of looking at it. Uh, but the problem with democracies is that they have very short-term horizons. The, the experts may not, but the politicians do. Mm -hmm. And I worry that uh, things, you know, you get a sort of inexorable slide towards something which is worse than you'd want. Um, we'd, nobody in their right minds really would want to have a cold war between the U.S. and China. But it's not exactly a warm feeling at the moment, and it's hard to see how the warmth will return. That, I think, is the real problem. And there's no real analogy with the old Cold War. Uh, you had the non-aligned movement, but in fact, the non-aligned movement really had to sort of uh, choose sides in the end. I don't think that's going to happen this time because history is not going to repeat itself. But nonetheless, I don't think we're in a happy place. And if, I mean, God forbid, Donald Trump were to become president again, um, all bets are off. Plus, just a last thing, um, we really do not, I think, understand Xi Jinping. We don't have a real picture of him. If you are in East Asia or in India and, and South Asia, Yes, you have this security architecture. You've got alliances between the U.S. and um, individual countries. And you've got the Quad and so on, which I think was an excellent idea. Um, so it's better to talk. But I don't think, we, I think it was Lee Kuan Yew who once said when, you know, elephants uh, fight, the grass gets trampled. And when they make love, the grass gets trampled as well. So uh, we're not really in a terribly happy position. Anyone else want to jump yeah, in? Okay, well, I think there are many differences between uh, Taiwan and Ukraine. The first one we have to keep in mind is Taiwan is an island. There is no, no territorial continuity between mainland China and Taiwan. So uh, to con 
take control of an island, even with a ma very modern and sophisticated military, it's a, it's a, it's a very complicated task. Um, I don't think that the PLA today is ready to launch, uh, you know, a landing operation uh, against Taiwan. It can uh, launch missile strikes. It can maybe impose a blockade, but the problem with the blockade is uh, how long you can hold it. And uh, the big difference between uh, Ukraine and Taiwan is I don't think that uh, the U.S. can conduct a proxy war in Taiwan. Uh, it's, uh, it's very likely, it's highly likely that the U.S. will be involved in the war in Taiwan with all the risks attached to the fact that you have two nuclear power uh, involved in a, in, in a direct confrontation. So um, I think that will continue to sort of uh, compel China to think twice before launching an attack against Taiwan. What I see, and I agree with this, uh, one this, uh, on that, is that it's more likely that China will continue to, it's what it has been called, it's a gray zone strategy of coercion against Taiwan, than to uh, 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 start a full-fledged invasion of Taiwan. Now, the problem with the f uh, gray zone strategy is that it, it, it's not without risks. And what I'm worried about, of course, is that, uh, as I think uh, it was alluded to by T. Su, is the fact that the uh, gray zone strategy can get out of control. Um, imagine if uh, the uh, PLA uh, Air Force enters Taiwan's uh, airspace. Uh, the, uh, the Taiwanese uh, fighter will have to scramble and to, 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 to um, you know, force these uh, fighters to move out of the airspace in one way or another. So um, there are risks of, uh, of incidents and even of military crisis. The big question is how we both, I mean, the U.S. and uh, no, Taiwan and China, first of all, will be able to manage that crisis. There is no channel of communication now between men in China and Taiwan. I mean, the, the yeah. because China has refused to talk to the Ta Taiwan, and that's that's a real issue. Um, you know, on Taiwan, there is a, a growing. Uh, uh, you know, in Taiwanese identity, which doesn't mean that everyone is in favor of independence, but I think the idea is that uh, uh, Taiwan is not the PRC. It's, a, it's another entity which has an official name, which is the Republic of China. And even if it's not recognized as a nation state, it's a de facto state. So we had, we, we, I mean, we have to admit the reality that there are actually, even if there is one China, there are two states or two governments, which should be, you know, should interact on an equal footing. And even if the KMT comes back to power in Taiwan, I don't think that uh, the issue will be solved because everyone in Taiwan is against the idea that Taiwan becomes a special administrative region of the PRC. Uh, Taiwan has never been part of the PRC, so it will, I mean, both sides will have to negotiate another deal. And here, I think uh, it, w it would be much more pro productive of the part of China to sort of uh, open the channel of communication with the, Ch with the Chinese authorities, whoever sits in the presidential palace in Taipei. And here, uh, we're far from it. So if there is a role of uh, uh, honest broker that the U.S. could play, is to sort of convince China to uh, talk to uh, the authorities in Taiwan, whoever they are. Well, it was Renaud who, who mentioned the Thucydides trap. <laughs> and I mean, Graham Allison, of course, says it's not inevitable, but it's likely, yep. uh, which I th think is rather worrying. Yes, but the nuclear, I mean, the fact that we are having two nuclear powers, I think it's a disincentive. For, it should uh, sober people up. But uh, we don't know, because yeah. uh, that was true under the, at the time of the old Cold War, yeah. whether it's going to remain true in the new Cold War. Or, or the fact, uh, it's, it's another story. I mean, the, and that's from, it. From, from your two responses, I, I get that, you th let's say, You'd say 60% unlikely there'll be an attack on Taiwan, but there's enough unusual circumstances and potential conflict opportunities that it might be 40% lead us into an undesired conflict. Uh, others have a reaction to that? Uh, je, je ne pense pas du tout que il va y avoir euh, une attaque euh, dans, comme nous a dit notre collègue chinois, dans le futur proche euh, de Taiwan pour plusieurs raisons. Euh, la première c'est que ça ne correspond pas à la stratégie chinoise. La stratégie chinoise, c'est de gagner euh, la guerre sans bataille. Euh, et donc, d'arriver à un moment où la flotte chinoise ce sera, sera si considérable euh, que euh, les Taïwanais eux-mêmes diront « Bon, OK, on va aller euh, baiser la babouche » à Pékin et euh, les Chinois de Pékin y répondront « Eh bien, mes chers amis, mais bien sûr, vous pouvez garder votre autonomie et vous gérer euh, euh, vous-même ». Je pense que c'est ça la stratégie chinoise. Il y a eu 
les Chinois euh, sont des commerçants, ce ne sont pas des guerriers. Alors, euh, et lorsqu'ils ont voulu jouer aux guerriers, euh, ça s'est très mal passé, c'était contre le Vietnam en 1900. 79, quand ils ont voulu donner une leçon, c'est plutôt le Vietnam qui a donné une leçon à la Chine. Donc je pense que euh, ce n'est pas leur idée, que d'ailleurs, euh, ce sont des commerçants et donc ils veulent protéger leur commerce. Et ils savent très bien que s'ils attaquent euh, Taïwan, il y aura euh, des répercussions, euh, des sanctions considérables. Et ils les évitent. Et j'ai remarqué que euh, les grandes sociétés chinoises, et on peut me contredire ici, mais les grandes sociétés chinoises, qui ont très peur des sanctions de Washington et de Bruxelles, respectent les sanctions, je parle des grandes sociétés, qui ont été euh, décidées contre la Russie euh, sur la guerre euh, en Ukraine. Alors évidemment, euh, une attaque de Taïwan serait possible. Elle serait possible quand Eh bien, lorsque euh, les Américains auraient la tête ailleurs. Euh, on a déjà eu ce phénomène. On a déjà eu la Turquie qui a pris 40% de l'île de Chypre à l'été 1974. Pourquoi est-ce que la Turquie a pu prendre comme ça 38% de l'île de Chypre bien Parce que le pouvoir à Washington était complètement paralysé ce jour-là par l'affaire du Watergate. Donc je pense que si les Chinois attaquaient Taïwan, il le ferait, par exemple, pendant une élection américaine ou une élection contestée ou quelque chose comme ça. Mais, euh, mais je ne je, je, sais pas leur... Aujourd'hui, ça ne me semble pas être leur politique. Leur politique première me semble, mais je peux, peux me tromper, me semble être de, avant tout, protéger leur commerce. Merci pour introduire ces facteurs, Renaud. Listening to Jisoo and all of the conversations and thinking about, you know, you say we don't know Xi Jinping after 10 years in office. Well, if we don't know him after 10 years, I'm worried because we, yeah. we ought to know something about the man by now. It strikes he's, me. But I don't think he's had any single interview with oh, he won't. A, a length he won't. interview. Exactly. No, you know, that's not going to happen. Um, but I, I, was, I would propose this is a good, a good time if China wants to, to, to change its tactics. The, uh, we, we're seeing, in various subtle ways, China pulling back on its aggressiveness in the South China Sea, the Sen Senkaku Islands and others. They're not changing fundamental positions, but they're being less aggressive. Mm. Maybe that will be true on the Indian line of actual control as well, I don't know, at this point. But it would be, uh, for me, it would be a great time for China to show some tactical flexibility if Kevin McCarthy shows up in Taipei with a delegation China says, what, another <laughs> speaker of the House shows up? Who cares? Yeah. We're not going to have an act. Secondly, China can quietly begin to recommence communication with Taiwan's authorities. Send some faxes with their former contacts who were in regular contact with the mainland before Tsai Ing-wen got elected as president. China could lower the temperature a lot during this crisis uh, or to, to head off a crisis uh, in the time ahead if it wants to think creatively. Yeah, I mean, do you have a point? I want to turn some to the audience in a couple minutes, so please be yeah. brief. I think, uh, you see, uh, this year, U.S. has made uh, two very important declarations regarding China. One is uh, made by Janet Yellen, U.S. Trade Secretary, in April that U.S. will pursue free but secure trade with French shoring. It's a very significant declaration. That means the U.S. will not address China issues within the context of WTO. A second, the important declaration was made by, in October by U.S. National Security Strategy, which designated China as the only competitor which both have intent and capability to reshape international order. Mm. It was preceded by sweeping ban on sales of advanced chips to China a week earlier. You know, the, uh, Thomas Friedman of New York Times described that it is the factor declaration of war of the United States against China. But I would like to draw your attention that U.S. rhetoric is very strong. However, with regard to IPF, the core strategy of U.S. Indo-Strategic 
Indo-Pacific Indo strategy, Indo-Pacific economy framework, U.S. has not invited Taiwan. IPF is de facto FTA negotiations minus market access. However, it's a FTA which is totally legal under the WTO, even if U.S. invited Taiwan, because since the FTA is negotiated under the framework WTO, WTO membership is not for sovereign states, it's for customs territory. So it is totally legal for US to include Taiwan in IPF, but they do not. They instead pursue bilateral trade and investment agreement with Taiwan, which I think US is mindful of the lead line with regard to Taiwan by China. U.S. strong rhetoric against possibility of China's aggression to Taiwan is to deter China's aggression into Taiwan, I may suspect. Thank you. Come here. Two short points, and I think we can go to the audience. The first. I am really worried when very wise people around the world somehow assume that she is a very rational and sane actor. And there are no data points to prove that. Nothing that he has done since he has taken charge would lend you to believe that you're dealing with someone who is rational and, and uh, mature. And yet we are uh, painting him in uh, the colors of great wisdom. Well, he did have wolf warrior Diplomacy. Uh, yeah, so that is quite wise, right? Yeah. Uh, uh, so uh, if, if that is the data point that makes you believe that he is a wise actor, uh, I'm worried. Now that's one part of it. So I think let's, be a, let's not be premature in our assessment that uh, we are dealing with someone who's, 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 who's wise and sage and will bide his time. He's, he's not interested in biding his time anymore. I think that is the only single message that is coming out of Xi's China. No need to hide, no need to bide, it is time to stake claim, and it's time to reshape the politics of the world. I think that is the single message. If you're not hearing it, then I want you to come to some conferences we host in Delhi and start hearing that. Because I think some of us don't get the message. That's number one. Number two, uh, and this is important. I think forget about Taiwan. The question should be, what do you do when China decides to change the territory, territorial map of any country in the world? I think that's the question you should ask. They gave you a fait accompli in South China Sea, what did you do? They disregarded the tribunal verdict, what did you do? They decided to change the map of the Himalayas, what did you do? You told us, trade more with China, have a dialogue. If I was Taiwan, I should be very worried. None of your behavior should give any sort of confidence to Taiwan that there is going to be any sort of response from any quarter. You will tell Taiwan, we will have a new trade deal with you, join them. I suspect that is going to be the voice coming out of Europe. Because that is what we heard. Now, I'm not even going further west. Ask the Afghanistan folks what they think about believing in, any folk, in, in anyone who believed that they were going to create order and value-based foreign policies. You threw them under the truck. In prime time, you know, prime time television. Who is in that part of the world going to rely on any sort of, uh, anyway, sorry. Well, thank you for those two interjections.